for myself. I read this the other day and I thought this was a great statement. The biggest thing to be afraid of is not failure. The biggest thing to be afraid of is that we will succeed at something that's useless. And I'm gonna tell you something, women, you gotta step out and do something. If you wait until fear and nervousness is gone, you will wait forever. But if you'll just be willing to take a step of faith and say, God, even if I get rejected, I'm gonna do it. Whatever you call me to do. And when you begin to step out in faith and just step out and, and be strong and courageous, God is gonna do great things through you. Amen, amen. Because you realize, wait a minute, if he sustained me in my 20s and my 30s and even in my teenage years, when I look back and see little things I wrote down, I go, oh my gosh, the Lord was, the Lord was moving even then to derail me into, into a particular direction. That track record becomes a booster for you in the current things that you're facing in your life. Just to your point, Dad, about building your confidence and your relationship with the Lord before the storm comes. I think one of the um, ways that people can do that, I know it's been helpful for me, I didn't even realize I was doing it, but actually writing down and keeping a track record of when you see the fingerprints of God in your life. Mm -hmm. um, I look back now and realize I was probably just keeping a little journal. I'm not one of those people that journals like every day or you know, even every, you know, religiously every week or anything like that. But just when something happens, that I see the fingerprints of God opening a door or closing a door that in hindsight I realize was his best plan for me. Um, or I see something happening where it's just what some would consider ordinary, but there's the traces of God's handiwork just moving things around. I write that down because you won't remember what happened a decade ago. But when you open up this little book, you've scribbled some notes about what God has done. And then you look back and you begin to actually see mm -hmm. how things that seemed disconnected at the time or just seemed like it wasn't going your way, how you're working God work, watching God work that out. Then it helps to build your confidence when you're going through something now because you realize, wait a minute, if he sustained me in my 20s and my 30s and even in my teenage years, when I look back and see little things I wrote down and I go, oh my gosh, the Lord was, the Lord was moving even then to derail me into, into a particular direction that track record becomes a booster for you in the current things that you're facing in your life. Mm. So I, I've even done that with my sons. I've kept a little journal for each of the boys. I bought a little journal when I started when my oldest was five. I went to Ross Dress for Less in the back corner there. They've got these little journals for $5.99. And I've had the same ones for, I guess, now 15 years. And every now and then when I just see just a little hint in a question they've asked or a conversation we've had or some way I can see God working and moving and something he's lined up for them, I write it down because I wanna be able to give it to them and say, look, if, if he did this for you, then when you hit the bumps of life, mm -hmm. which we all are, then you can trust him because he's already proven to you that he's going to be faithful. Yeah. And Jonathan, you mentioned wrestling with God, which we all watched you do firsthand because you are the athlete of the family. Like you, you do this and then you end up here. Mm -hmm. You work out and you end up doing, but like that's just kind of how your mind works. But as we talk about, as, as we've heard these things that were said, I remember, I think in chapter nine of the book, you basically talk about getting to the place where you realized that God's answer was yes or yes. And you had to get yourself there. Can you, can you elaborate on that when it comes yeah, to Yeah, absolutely. Um, just thinking about, you know what dad is saying in his conditional and unconditional mm -hmm. will. Like we met the conditions. So I'm like, uh, I'm just waiting. I did it. The yeah. whole time I'm hopeful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The whole yes. time. Yeah, we all were. And I'm watching much. mommy yeah. kind of decline, but I'm like, uh, it's okay because he's going to, it's, it's going to be a greater, you know Win. what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I, yeah. So I've, I've done that in my mind and, and the, the, the effort that we had put forward, just calling on the name of the Lord. And, and I felt like this was a great opportunity for him. <laughs> yeah. I put it on more. him. Yeah. God, this is a great opportunity for you now. No, you need to take advantage of this one. This is a, <laughs> That's right. This is a, everybody's watching. Yeah. Um, and so I, I kind of got to a place where I really felt w was hopeful about it. And when he basically said no, mm -hmm. that's how I received it initially. Mm -hmm. That we did all of this and you just didn't come through. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you didn't make a way out of, out of no way. You know, you didn't do those things. But then God, you know, in my quiet time, in, sil in silence and solitude, I got clarity. Just spending time with God and he just said, you know, you don't understand my victory. You're complaining because you don't really understand what Jesus Christ has done. It was hard for you to watch your mother die. 
but how much harder was it to me to watch my son die so your mother can actually live? Mm -hmm. And when I thought about the life that has been given in his unconditional will, that his unconditional will, even meeting his conditions, were, was better than what I prayed for, trying to meet his conditional will. Um, you asked for healing, she's got it. Um, you asked her to be with family, she's got it. You asked her to be well taken care of, she's got it. Mm -hmm. You don't understand. I've given you everything you asked for on a higher level than you asked for it, and you don't understand it because you're a kid. Mm -hmm. you, you're not, you know what I'm saying? It's the same thing with my kids. They just don't get it. Mm -hmm. Until they get to a point of maturity where they're able to say, oh, dad, his will is just best. Mm. And, um, and now we can do what my mom always said, what my mom, like she's not yours. We can do it. Our mom always said, your greatest ministry will come right out of your greatest misery mm -hmm. and, um, and keep on going. You know, one of the ways me and daddy encourage each other, you know, through football is, you know, in, in football, every player has to retire. It happens every time. And the players that are still on the field are sad, you know, because that's, the, that's their guy. Right. But all you can do is put your head down and keep playing until you retire too. Mm -hmm. because you want to hear the coach say the same thing to you that he said to him. Well done. You played hard. Here's your gold jacket. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy retirement. And that's what mommy's doing. She retired. She's enjoying that retirement in his rest. Mm -hmm. And we're going to put our heads down. We're going to keep playing hard. That's great. All the way to the finish. Yeah. There are so many things that we had, had to, to learn. I mean, I, I didn't realize. I, I think daddy told me this. He thought that when we were going through this, and, and mommy thought this too. She would look at me and be like, are you okay? But it wasn't a normal, are you okay? It was kind of like, uh, this is the kid that could fall apart with, with this much weight on him emotionally. That, it was that kind of, are you okay? And I, all the things that we've talked about, all the lessons that I learned along the way, even in the hard moments of my life, I didn't realize were training me for this moment. In the book, um, I can't remember what, what chapter, but we tell the story of, of the karate kid, which I won't tell the whole thing now. Priscilla tells it a lot. Um, do you want to just hit on that real quick? I mean, well, just that there just, was a lot of training. I mean, the Karate Kid, you know, the, the yeah. one with Daniel son and Mr. Miyagi yes, from the, the, the original, yeah, the, the original yeah. one, not the new stuff. <laughs> yeah. Although that was good too. Yes, it but was. the original one, you know, Daniel son wants training, and in karate, so he goes to Mr. Miyagi, and Mr. Miyagi basically has him managing his house, cleaning cars, <laughs> right. painting fences, sanding the floor. Yep. And he just, Daniel becomes extremely frustrated. He's yeah. like, you, this is not I what I'm here fight. for. Yeah. yeah, I came here to train to be able to be excellent at the craft of karate. And so Mr. Miyagi sees his frustration and he starts throwing punches. And Daniel, without thinking about it, begins to block all of these punches and kicks that are coming his direction. He did not know that all of that training that seemed unnecessary and seemed mm -hmm. mundane and just like he was actually accomplishing nothing in that mundane training was actually everything that he needed to be prepared for the fight. He yeah. was learning. Yeah. He was becoming masterful at the craft. It just didn't look like it in the moment. Mm. I don't know about you, but I think most of us, if we were really gut level honest, we would have to say that when we first start, first start wanting to be used by God, our motives are not all that stellar. I had been abused by my dad, and so I was very insecure. And to be honest, although I had a call on my life, part of me wanted to do it because I felt like I was being called to do it, but part of it wanted me to do it because I just wanted to be successful at something so I could feel good about myself. I can't stand here and tell you that day one, all I wanted to do was help other people. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to be in leadership. I wanted to be one of the important people at my church. I wanted to have my name on a seat. I wanted to have an office with my name on the door. And I wanted all of those things for the wrong reasons. Now that didn't mean I wasn't called, but it did mean that God had to do a work of purification in my life to get me to the point where, for every, where everything I was doing was being done, number one, in obedience to him, and number two, to help people. And that takes a while. How many of you know what I mean when I'm talking about motives? Let me, let me just give you a homework assignment. I'll never know if you did it or not, but just pretend like you're going to. <laughs> Sometime when this is over and you have some quiet time at home, write down everything that you spend your time doing and then go back and ask yourself why 
you're doing it. Everybody gets quiet at this point. <laughs> I mean, it is amazing how quiet people get when you start talking about motives. You know why? Our motives are not what we're doing. It's why we're doing what we're doing. And guess what? That's the only part God cares about. He's not impressed by our big ministries or our friends on Facebook or this or that or anything else. The only thing he's concerned about is why are you doing what you're doing. And you know, 1 Corinthians 3.13 says that the work of each one of us will become plainly and openly known, shown for what it is, for the day of Christ will disclose and declare it because it will be revealed with fire and the fire will test and critically appraise the character and the worth of the work that each person has done. And it goes on to say that if what we've done is a pure work, we'll get our reward. And if not, all the works will be burned up even though we ourselves will still be saved. I don't know about you, but I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to spend my life with some misconceived, deceptive idea that I'm doing everything I'm doing for God when really a lot of it is just for myself. I read this the other day and I thought this was a great statement. The biggest thing to be afraid of is not failure. The biggest thing to be afraid of is that we will succeed at something that's useless. I think we could say that again, right? The biggest thing to be afraid of is not failure. The biggest thing to be afraid of is that we might succeed at something useless. I just wrote a book released at last fall called Seize the Day. And in that book, I tried to share with people how important it is to live your life on purpose for a purpose. I don't think any of us can realize how valuable time is until you get old enough in life to where you're not having too much of it left. You think totally differently when you're 20 and 30 and 40 and even 50 and 60. And I can tell you when I was in my 60s, I realized one day two-thirds of my life was over. Even if I lived to be in my mid-90s, two-thirds of it was over. And I only had about a third left. And I tell you, I really have a passion to tell people, don't waste your life. And don't waste your time. And one of the ways that we can waste our lives is doing things that really are not important to God just to try to impress people. Amen? Now, I know that talking about motives gets people kind of somber, so we'll go on and talk about something else now. <laughs> Thank you. During that period of time, we also have the privilege of having a lot of humility worked into our lives. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, but I can tell you that if you don't humble yourself, God will do it for you. And it's much more painful when he does it than if we go ahead and do it. I don't know if you're willing to admit it or not, but I think most of us when we start are pretty full of ourselves. <laughs> Anybody? Come on, don't look so innocent. I'm here. <laughs> I've only been a month since I had my hip sawed in half. I'm here to help you, so look like you're being helped. See, I like to get into the deeper stuff because I just don't think we've got a lot of time to mess around. Amen. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar the king, Daniel 4, 1 through 4. This is such a good story. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all the people, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, may peace be multiplied to you. Verse 2, it seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed toward me. Now, I want you to notice that in the beginning of this chapter, he's given God all the credit. Look what God's done. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. And I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and prospering in my palace. 
You see, as long as we're giving God the credit, we have rest and we have peace. Now, I don't know what happened to poor Nebuchadnezzar, but somehow in 26 verses, he fell completely apart. And I don't really know how long 26 verses takes in the Bible, but it didn't take me very long to read it. And by the time we get around to verse 30, the king said, is not this the great Babylon that I have built? As the royal residence in the seat of government by the might of my power and for the honor and the glory of my majesty. <laughs> wow. You see, success can be dangerous. Yes, I said success can be dangerous because there's always a danger that we might begin to think that we actually had something to do with it. Or even worse than that, and I think God hates this the most, we might begin to think that we're actually better than other people. And then if we're not very careful, we'll begin to mistreat other people that we don't think are quite as important as we are. We're not very useful to God if we don't beg him to work in our lives to keep us humble. No matter, and nothing hurts worse than having God deal with your pride. I used to have a series on my table called Pride and Humility. I finally realized that nobody was gonna buy that. So I have gotten very good at hiding my messages under other titles. How to succeed with God. <laughs> Five ways to find promotion. And I do that, I really do. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. Let me tell you something, it takes a lot longer to build something up than it does for God to tear it down. We all beg God for big things, I did. And I love to share this with the people that are in leadership. I remember when the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, I just want you to remember that however many people you can help, that's exactly how many you can hurt. That's why leadership is such a huge responsibility. Not just a privilege, but a responsibility. Because people watch everything you do. You know, I wanted to speak into the call of God upon your life because God put purpose and greatness inside of you. And, you know, I think back on my life and how... Uh, you know, when I knew God had a call on my life, there's always, there was always this voice of inadequacy. You're not qualified, this fear. And I just want you to know that when God calls you to do something, he's going to help you do it. And, but you will fight this fear, these feelings. And I learned a long time ago that you just have to do it anyway, no matter how you feel. And uh, amen. Because, because the feelings, the fear will always be there. But um, I remember, you know, when I first, even as a teenager, started to pray with people. You know, I was afraid I was going to say the wrong thing. And then when I first started speaking, you know, I was so nervous. And I, I just thought, I, I'm not qualified. But, you know, I learned this, that no matter how we feel, God will anoint us to do what he's called us to do. And he doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. Amen. If he calls you, he's going to equip you and he's going to anoint you to do it. And, and God said to Joshua, he, as soon as he was to take over from Moses, after Moses died, you know, think about the fear that, that Joshua was feeling, the, how he had to step into Moses' feet. And three times God said to him, don't be afraid, be strong and courageous. He ended up saying, I, I'm commanding you, Joshua, don't be afraid, but be strong and courageous. And I know that God has been speaking to you to do certain things. Maybe it's just an act of obedience. Maybe he is calling you to take this 
great step of faith. And I want to say to you that God is saying, don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy because even though you may be unqualified, God will qualify you and he will be with you and he will help you every step of the way. I, w I was just thinking about something funny, uh, Victoria, because when I was in college, you know, I was I always grew up, it's hard to believe it, but I grew up sort of shy and quiet. And when I was in college my first year, I really wanted to do something for God. I was out on my own. And so I applied at the end of the year to be a chaplain uh, in a dorm over 30 girls. And my brother Paul was uh, a chaplain um, director. And, you know, and I just had a desire to do something. And I thought, you know, I'm probably going to get it. I mean, after all, Paul's in there. I'm an Osteen, you know, everybody loves my dad, you know, and, but would you believe after I interviewed and all that, they, they said that they didn't think I was qualified and they rejected me, you know, and so I just thought, well, that's okay, but they said this, they said, we feel like uh, you're a little too shy and quiet right now, and the truth is, I was shy and quiet, but something in me was saying, God was saying, I want to use you. I want to do something through you. And so I took that step of faith and I applied, but I got rejected. But let me tell you something, people, women, when God, when people close the door, God will open another door. And so I just took it, you know, I went through the summer and right before school started, I got a call from the chaplain's office and they said, hey, one of the chaplains can't come back to school and we want you after all. And so... <laughs> I thought, well, I wasn't their first choice, but I was God's choice. <laughs> and the truth is, I was not qualified, but God didn't care. And he wanted me. God chose me even though I wasn't qualified. God chose me even though I wasn't ready. And so I didn't even feel ready to be the chaplain, but I stepped out. And I'm going to tell you something, women. you got to step out and do something. If you wait until fear and nervousness is gone, you will wait forever. But if you'll just be willing to take a step of faith and say, God, even if I get rejected, I'm going to do it whatever you call me to do. And when you begin to step out in faith and just step out and, and be strong and courageous, God is gonna do great things through you. Amen, amen. Yes, we receive that. No matter what you're going through today, God wants you to love your life. He gave you life. The scripture says that Jesus came to give you life and life more abundantly. Not everything goes our way. We face challenges, we face difficulties, but God doesn't want you to stop living. He doesn't want you to stop pushing. He doesn't want you to stop pressing because in those difficulties, you will find God and you'll come out on the other side of that difficulty stronger than you ever thought possible. I want to say to be encouraged to all the women because even though it may be a difficult season right now, God is birthing things in you that are going to just surprise and shock you in such a great way. And He will bring you through it. He promised. He said that He will, uh, he will provide a way of escape through whatever you're going through. He's your deliverer. He's your refuge. He's your rock. And just remind yourself of those wonderful characteristics of God because He's there for you. But I just want to encourage you to just enjoy when you're living, the season that you're living in, and just do what God speaks in your heart to do. If God tells you to do something, people can't change what God told you to do. But I want Him to say about us all, women, men, everybody that's serving God, very well done, my good and faithful servant. Yes! I like that. you got to fight the good fight of faith. And you know what? Sometimes when you're fighting, you can get worn out if you're trying to do it in your own strength, but you won't get worn out if you're doing it in the strength of God. And you know, I love the fact that you are, you know, you are prepared with God's Word. You're not waiting to feel down and think, what am I going to do? But you know what? You got the fight in you because you got God's Word and you know that He's called you to be more than an overcomer and isn't it good? We know the end of the story. We win. Amen? Amen.